something else. But having it hit your eye from an angle helps. It doesn't actually give you vitamin D, but it just brightens your eyes. And you may notice that you have more energy and less likely to feel depressed. So that's if, if, you're, if you're in a situation where you can't get as much sunlight. Like in Michigan or even down here in Ohio, you, you know, it can get quite dismal at some points in the winter. But the Bible also told us this in Ecclesiastes 11.7, where it says, Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the what? The sun. These principles were given to us in inspiration. We see this here. And natural methods of overcoming. The first one we're talking about is negative ions, getting fresh air. Number two is light therapy. And number three is exercise. These three things can help overcome depression. These three things can help overcome depression. We're going to look at several, but let's look at the research on exercise. How many, we already talked about this, how many miles to walk off a pound? It's 35 miles. But for depression, is it possible to run away from depression? So exercise, the main point of it is, isn't to lose weight because it's not the best at losing weight. It's more important for your mental health. So let's look at this. This is a study called the SMILE study, Stanford Medical Intervention and Long-Term Exercise Trial. And it was a 16-week trial, and they took 156 patients and put them into three different groups. One group was the Zoloft group. That's a depression medication. They had another group they would put on simply an exercise program, and another group they did both. They would exercise and take Zoloft. I mean, logically, you'd think, okay, if this has a benefit and this has a benefit, you put them together, you'd get greater benefit right here. I mean, that would be logical. But what do we find? The exercise group was to exercise for 30 minutes to 30 or 70 to 85 percent of their target heart rate three times a week. So these people would three times a week exercise. What is 70 to 85 percent of your target heart rate? It's different for different ages. So if you really want to know, you could just Google at some point. You punch in your uh, age and then to say target heart rate. And to get it to 70 to 85, you could figure out what that is for you. And what happened? All groups had a drop in depression. Nearly half of each group were no longer depressed. An additional 13% had less symptoms, but were not totally depression-free. But six months later, the exercise group, the ones who were only exercising, was doing the best. The 50%, 55% of the mixed group, the ones who took the depression medication and exercise, they were depressed six months later. What it turns out is the group that did the worst were the ones who took the drugs and the exercise. You would have thought they did the best, right? And 52% of the medication group was depressed, but only 30% of the exercise group. So exercise in this particular trial was the greatest remedy for depression. So if at all possible, and the great thing is, you know, if you, we live in a time where, you know, if you got bad knees, you can, there's other things you can do for, you know, upper body exercise to get your blood pumping. And so you could go, go to a gym. I know with COVID, it's kind of hard right now. It's, you know, people don't really want to do that as much, but hopefully you can have something at home. There are different things. You can watch things on the internet where you don't have to have any machinery. There's exercise programs for anybody on there and they're totally free. So there are always options out there even if you are in a situation where your body is compromised in some capacity. So exercise, very, very important. Number four is avoiding excess sugar. Now, when I say that, we're not talking about avoiding fruit. We're talking about the refined form of sugar. And let's look at this. This, we are told here, it has been discovered that people who ate more sugar were more depressed. But the question remained. Was it the depression that caused people to eat more sugar, or was it the additional sugar that was a causative factor in depression? Because when you correlate two things, like for instance, oh, it seems that depressed people eat more sugar. Well, is it the sugar that caused the depression, or is it the depression that caused them to eat more sugar? So it's hard to tell sometimes, right? So they had to try to parse that out. And a study from the University College London, looking at more than 8,000 adults following them from the 1980s, discovered that men who ate the most sugar had 23% higher likelihood of becoming pressed, depressed within the next five years. So it seemed to actually increase the likelihood later on. So it did seem to be a causative factor. 
So sugar is just something that's almost ubiquitous in society and refined foods, but getting away from these might help not just, I mean, mainly it can help your mental health, and that's one of the greatest subjects. So my wife's going to come up, and she is going to keep us going, looking at more points on depression. Okay. So uh, trans fats, and Chad told us... Oh, okay, I can... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. He had made some... Anyway, we'll move on. Uh, so you heard her. Did you say this up front? Oh, yeah. When you cook meat, it tr turns into trans fat. So there is still something that has trans fat in it. But legally... Oh, okay, I'll just read this. Uh, things like margarine, Crisco, are a form of fat called trans fat. Research in the Avenus Health Study 2 revealed that consumption of trans fats was correlated with higher levels of unhappy feelings. So the more trans fats you eat, the more depressed you're going to be. And uh, this year is the first year that we, the food industry is not allowed to put any trans fat into their packages. So they were given, you know, some, some time to change that, and this year is the first year where they are not allowed to. Now, with that said, I don't know if they can still get away with, you know how if you have a trace amount of something, you can not put it in the, in the nutrition facts, right? Have you guys noticed that? Yeah, so it's under half a gram. They're, they're not legally bound to tell you what's in it. So maybe you should keep some old packages and see who used trans fats. <laughs> and then you're like, I think they might still be using it. No, just anyway. Packaged foods, as much as possible, stay away from it. Um, other than if you're eating whole foods, right? And what do I mean by that? Um, you can buy whole grain pasta, right? That would be better than the refined pasta. pasta. Okay. Anyway, so this is interesting and important to stay away from trans fats because we don't want to be unhappy people. We want to be happy people. Uh, Proverbs 25, verse 27, it says, it is not good to eat much honey. And so Chad was just showing us about sugar causing depression. So the Bible has that um, remedy for us too, right? Not too much. And the problem is, is in the U.S., we've kind of gone beyond too much, <laughs> you know? It's in everything. Every package you pick up has sugar in it, right? Because we've become addicts to this stuff. And they know how to addict us, right? How to put just the right amount in to get you addicted. And so it's, it's better just to, in, in terms of things like honey, just use moderation, not too much, right? Uh, sugar, the brain, and mental states. Sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation, and this clouds the brain and brings peevishness, there's that word again, into the disposition. So it makes you irritated, easily irritated from having sugar in your stomach. And um, especially, oh yeah, here's peevish, peevishness. Uh, easily irritated, especially by unimportant things. Don't you love that definition? <laughs> easily irritated by unimportant things. So um, the thing with fermentation, especially when you have sugar and milk together, causes fermentation in your stomach. So it's important not to... Uh, what, what would have uh, sugar and milk together? Yeah, everyone was quick on that one. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Okay, yeah, we all know. All right, so, so if you don't want fermentation in your stomach, here is another incentive, right? Another incentive. All right, let's move on. So uh, let's continue. It says here, Natural methods of overcoming. Chad already talked about negative ions, light therapy, exercise, avoiding sugar. 
but also avoid alcohol or other mind altering drugs, which cause us to potentially be depressed. Uh, how about sleeping? Is that a good one? Yes, we learned earlier this morning that sleep can affect your waistline, but it can also affect your mood, right? And so um, it helps keep off the pounds, but depression away as well. And the best time is 9 a.m., I mean, p.m., sorry, <laughs> 9 p.m. So um, we try as much as possible, even with all our travels and stuff, to stick to that. If we're at least in bed by that time, you know, you're making a good, you know, you, you're going in the right direction is what I should say. So you could lay in bed if you're, if you're not used to it for a while and just read, do something in bed so that you're getting yourself ready and wound down. Uh, you don't want to have screen time before bed because screens um, keep your mind awake, right? It tells your eye that there's light and what outside has light? The sun, right? Well, if there, it's dark outside, that's telling your brain it's time for bed. But if you put this light in front of you, you're telling your brain it's light outside. And so you confuse yourself and your brain, but also the type of light. So in the evening, the light is softer, right? Outside, the light is softer. And the same should be in the home. Some people actually in the evening will only use soft lights so that they could get their mind in that frame of mind of we need to get ready for bed. But so many of our homes now have what? LED lights that are the blue lights that are very bright. And that's like the sun, you know, not the evening sun. We're talking about the midday sun. And so that keeps you more awake. So some people, if they have like these types of lights overhead, the, you know, the ceiling ones, those will be like the bright ones. But then for the evening, they'll have lamps around the house that will be the, the calm light, right? The warm light. And then you could transition that way. And some take another step. I mean, again, remember when I'm sharing these things, it's not for everybody to do every little thing. It's if you see some area that you really struggle with, maybe you need to do more in that area, right? So some of our friends, they actually use um, glasses that have a tint to them in the evenings. They actually wear them around the house in the evening so that all they don't have to change all the lights in their home. Hey, everybody, you know, you guys are a little more south than us. We're up in Michigan, and so we have to think about these things a little more. But we haven't done that. We, we just mostly try to um, keep away from the lights in the evening and, and you know, have it just a little um, warmer lights in our bedroom. Like in our bedroom, we have put no canned lights that are bright. We have left that to be like the softer lights. Just an idea, anybody that struggles in these areas. So it's important. Uh, and then you heard earlier today, eight servings of fruit or vegetables, right? Is important to also have plenty of vegetables to make us happier people. Does anyone have any questions about the lights and all of that stuff? Oh, he's going to share some on that subject. This is very powerful that just like Fadia said, when you have midday sun, even around right now, it's not quite midday anymore, but it is a bluer light. And as you get towards sunset, it is what, what, what color does it become more when the sun's going down? Yeah. Yeah. Orangish red. And you can even buy the light bulbs. And what's very fascinating is so when we make these fake lights, especially bluer type lights, they are going to make us be more awake, which, you know, in the winter when it's really dark, that can be nice to keep you up in the morning. That's a good thing. But if you take the, like, the color of a flame, like a firelight, that light does not keep you awake. It actually helps you to get ready for bed. Isn't that interesting that God made it that way? Because can you think of anything more calming than sitting and looking at a fire before going to bed? And then you don't lie down and go, oh, man, it's so bright. That, that fire was so overwhelming to me, right? No, it, it's just perfectly designed. 
everything in nature, the way God made it, is just amazing. I mean, it really is, especially the more you learn about the science of it all, the more glorious it is, right? The more capacity your brain has to worship the Creator. Because true science is all in line with the Word of God. True science. Now, I've got to be honest, and we've all seen it that this year, we've seen that science is many times as shifting as the sands of the sea. Yes or no? One week we're told something's good, the next week we're told something is bad. And I'm, that's not an insult. That's because science is a constant, they're desiring to find truth. And, and I, I study science all the time, all the time, all the time. I love science. But you can find two contradictory studies studying the exact same thing and come to opposite conclusions because they're made by humans. Now, you are told just like I was probably when you were in middle school about science. You learned about what scientific reasoning is, and you were told that scientists have no biases. <laughs> and then we found reality when we grew up, right? There's, there's stories you tell, that people tell children, like about Santa Claus, right? And that scientists have no bias, right? And these are, these are lies we tell our kids accidentally. I'm just kidding. We don't intentionally do that. Because the thing is, I don't say that as an insult, but you know what scientists are? Humans. And humans have opinions, it's not like when you become a scientist, you become converted to unbiasedness, right? You're still a human. And I don't say that to be an insult. They've even, they've even, they even did a survey of scientists, and, and statistically, a number of scientists will admit falsifying data on their scientific studies. Not all of them, but even if you were not trying to lie, imagine if I were paying your company $10 million to do a study and I was giving you a medication that I thought was good for cancer. Now, if you were doing the study, wouldn't you hope that it was good for cancer? You would hope so. I would hope so if I were a scientist. I mean, I wouldn't think like, well, I hope it does absolutely nothing. And I work a few years on it doing nothing. I mean, deep down, I would want my even scientific expertise to be a part of I helped find the discovery for the cure of blank, right? So that's not evil per se. It's just natural that you would be that way. So that's not, that's not to be an insult. That's not to be pejorative to scientists. It's just they're human. They're human, and their paycheck is on the line. And if I came to you and I gave you $50 million to do a study, you're going to hope that it works out well because you're going to want me to fund you again, right? And that's not an insult. It's just it's human nature, right? And so that, that it, is, it is what it is. So... Just to make one more comment about um, science and studies and why, again, I'm going to tell you our foundation is the Word of God. Because we need something to be our anchor, right? Everybody's got their anchor, and our anchor, we believe, is the Word of God. And so if a scientific study that I have contradicts somebody else's, I have to fall back on what? The Word of God. Well, this is the other thing. We've had people come up to us and say, well, what do you think about this scientific study? You know, that contradicts what we said, and it looks like good science. But I'll tell you this, some things that they do in science will just blow your mind when it comes to studies. They'll do things like this. They'll say, um, I don't know, give me an example of something. not true, but Butterfinger candy bars oh, yeah. are good ascents. Okay, yeah. Let's just say some kind of candy bar, okay? They'll say this candy bar is a really good snack. It is high in such and such. And you're like, wow, that's wonderful. But then when you go and read the study and you see what they compared it to, they compared it to a Twinkie. Now, if you're comparing a Twinkie and a candy bar, well, of course the candy bar is going to be better than the Twinkie, right? So you see, you always have to investigate what were you comparing it to, right? Because if you're, if you're comparing, and, and that's really how some things get passed in Congress, 
is because they falsify the science. Okay, I'll, get, I'll give you an example, and this has to do with marriage. For years, marriage um, studies were presented before Congress comparing a, a, a family, a normal family, right, to a different type of family, okay? They compare the two. And the normal family was always doing better. The children were doing well, this, that, and the other. Then later the science changed and they weren't comparing this alternative family to a normal family anymore. You know what they're comparing it to? A single mom home. So then they, they, they showed, look, a single mom home is not as bad as this alternative family. Therefore, they're, they're better the, the single mom is better, but not as good. I mean, not as, not as good as the, the normal family. You get what I'm saying? And so they presented it before Congress saying, look, this is what the studies show. They're just as normal as other kids. So then laws get passed because of bad statistics, because of bad studies. Do you get what I'm saying? And so they didn't look into it and say, well, what have you been comparing it to? What changed? You were com if you're comparing it to a normal family, well, of course now you can pass these laws because now you're comparing it to a family that's not as whole as a complete family. You get it. I don't need to beat a, a, a dog or a dead horse. <laughs> Whew, okay. Um, so speaking of sleep, Speaking of sleep, I've had bad sleep for the past couple of nights. And so this is what you get. <laughs> yes, this is exactly what you get. I get tongue-tied and have a hard time finding words. So um, anyway, so you understand. I'm, I'm just trying to give you foundations of how to look at studies when somebody presents something to you. They'll tell you things like, you know, coffee's good for you. It has antioxidants, which is true. Coffee has antioxidants, but is that the only reason I, I drink coffee? Like, what about the other things it causes, right? We're thinking more morals. I want my morals to be top-notch, right? So we look at things as a whole, right? Not as how, how many side effects can I put up with. So speaking of that, since she brought up coffee, she got off subject, but I, I could show you a video clip where, so they took a newscaster from ABC and what they did was they, she went and got an MRI scan of her brain showing the blood flow to her brain. They take another, another uh, MRI scan, but before that second scan, she went and drank one Starbucks coffee. She goes back into the MRI scanner, and there is a 40% drop in the blood flow to her brain after one Starbucks coffee. So it does have antioxidants, and so they'll show you, look, there's benefits to it. And when we're looking at holistic biblical health, the foundation is we're looking for things that are healthy without side effects. Standard medical treatment says... And this is totally honest. There's a, there's a drug called Accutane. Accutane is a depression medication. It is unbelievably successful. It will just make you want to kill yourself. It, yeah, it helps you with your acne. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I said depression. It's a skin medication for acne. I don't know what I, why I said that. It's a, and, and we know someone who uh, he was... Uh, actually, I shouldn't say his name. You'd, you'd, know, <laughs> you'd know his relatives. Uh, but he... He, um, they're not here, but he, he, he took this medication. And if you allow your kid to take this medication, you have to sign that your daughter will not get pregnant, that your child, that you recognize that they may, you know, want to kill themselves, but they won't have acne anymore, right? And so he took it and he literally began to want to kill himself. He just was overly emotional and just couldn't handle it. And he didn't realize himself that, that that's what was causing it. He just thought he was depressed. And so he literally was just overwhelming. And uh, finally, his parents realized that he quit taking Accutane, and it went away. And so now standard medical therapy would say that's a good drug because it gets rid of acne. In my estimation, that is a bad drug because nobody should want to kill themselves because they got rid of acne, right? 
what you could do is you could change your diet and get rid of acne. You could do that, and it would only have beneficial side effects. So the holistic view of health is to use things that have as few side effects, especially zero side effects would be the optimal, and they only have benefit. Do you follow? Whereas standard medical therapy, they'll say, yes, okay, caffeine may drop the blood flow to your brain by 40%. That's not good because you want adequate blood flow. Perfect health depends upon perfect circulation. So that wouldn't be good for me, but it does have antioxidants. The question is, does anything else have antioxidants? Every plant food that you can think of has antioxidants. Does that make sense? So you get the idea. We've given you a little philosophy treatment, but let's go on. So this is research that I just came out. This, uh, I put out this on a YouTube channel, our YouTube channel this week on health and homestead. Uh, I gave much more than I'm going to show you here. This is an actual study on morning larks versus night owls. This is the actual terminology in the scientific study. And this is from the journal Emotion. What they found, research reported in the journal Emotion, it looked into happiness and sleep time. They also looked at sleep time, emotion, and age. And what they found is that less young people are prone, actually, I, I, yeah, less, prone, less young people are prone to be morning larks, and these people who get up early and mostly go to bed early, that's the morning larks, as people increase to the age of 60, they are more prone to changing their sleep time to earlier and becoming morning larks. We're gonna talk about this and what happens. But many times people think, well, your genetic predisposition to either get up early or get up late and stay up late, that's just kind of genetically predisposed. It's just who you are. And so, I, but what did they just show? They showed that young people are less prone to get up early, but as they move to the age of 60, they're more prone to getting up early. That, that, that's you, brother? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, if you want to say something, go ahead, man. No, um, that comment has been told to me before. And I was told that when people get older, they think they're going to die. So they get up earlier so that they can get most out of the day. So that's something that my grandparents told me. When you get older, it's like you don't want to waste no time. Okay, so I got, I got to tell everybody because somebody's got to be watching online and they didn't hear. I'm going to repeat that. Is that okay? Test Let me repeat test. that. So what I was told is wh when you're young, you got a lot of life ahead, so you can sleep away some of it, right? And when you get old, you're like, man, I'm going to die soon. And so since I'm going to die soon, I better get up early so I don't miss a minute of life, right? <laughs> I have never heard that before, but you know what? You know, that's good. I like that. But, I, but what's interesting is... What's interesting is check out the result of this study. So it goes on to say, but whether people are old or young, those who are morning larks are happier. Isn't that powerful? So whether you're 60 or whether you're 16, if you want to be a happier person, go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. Isn't that powerful? So I used to consider myself a night owl. I used to go to bed, no kidding, 2 to 3 in the morning during high school. I would drink myself to sleep at night. And I was not happy. I was not happy. And then I would sleep all day at school. It was terrible. Totally unhealthy and totally unhappy. And yet later on in life, I came to a seminar. It was a Bible prophecy seminar. There was this young firecracker named David Asherick speaking. I was in college at the time. And I had never heard of these people before. He gets up, and he's preaching like a mile a minute, like, bah, 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 bah. and I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. And I listen to them all. I hear this seminar, and I, you know, I would stay up super, super late. But then I, I saw these things. I was baptized at the end of this Bible prophecy seminar. I went to a school in South Dakota called the Black Hills Mission College. I went to this school, and when I was there, my first roommate, he, he would go to bed at like 9, 9.30, and I, I didn't know how these people live, so, and they were eating a vegan diet. So I, I eat their food, and my roommate goes to bed between 9 and 9.30, so you know what I did? Went to bed, too. And then in the morning, I, I hear some rustling next to me, and I look, and it was like 5 in the morning, and he, just, he doesn't even get out of bed. He just rolls out of bed onto his knees, and he starts praying. 
And I was like, oh, I guess that's what you do. So I just rolled out of bed, and, and I started praying, honestly. And so then when he finished praying, he started reading his Bible. Now, I had been reading my Bible for the last few months at least, you know, probably in the morning. And so I was reading my Bible too, and he read his Bible from, you know, 5 basically until 8 o'clock. So that's what I did, read my Bible for three hours. Then we went to breakfast. Then I did that the next morning and the next morning, and I just figured, well, I guess that's what these people do, and so that's what I do now, right? And then my new roommate left. I had him for just a couple weeks, and uh, so then the next day, I got a new roommate. And uh, 5 o'clock rolled around, and you know what I did? I rolled out of bed because I figured that's what everybody does, right? And I started praying, and you know what my new roommate did? He rolled out of bed too and started praying. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, Later on, I didn't think about it for years later. I was like, I wonder if he did that just because I did that, you know? And, uh, but I'm so glad my first roommate did that, you know? What a good, good, a good witness he was to me. It changed my life. But I'd read my Bible for three hours, and I, I remember the pastor of the school, Pastor Louis Torres, came up to me. He's like, sure. I said, yes. He said, what'd you read this morning? And remember, I'd read for three hours, and you know what I said? I don't remember. <laughs> you know, three hours, I couldn't come up with anything, you know? And you say, well, was it worthless? No, I believe God was still working on my heart because I need it, right? So getting up early, I'm so glad I, but I'll tell you, in connection with this, I was happier than I had been in my almost my whole life up to that point. Going to bed early just changed my life. It can make, honestly, this can be, if you really struggle with depression, this can be one of the main factors. Exercise super important, diet is super important, and going to bed early, I think, are three of the most important factors. And we'll see if I have the next study in. Check this out. Night owls and mental health. New research out of Chronobiology International. It says people who are definitively evening people, who stay up later, compared with those who are morning people, have a 94% chance, higher chances of having a psychological disorder. 94% chance, higher chances. That is heavy, isn't it? So you could lower your chances of having a psychological disorder by 94% by doing one change in your life, going to bed early. Isn't that heavy? It's amazing. Research looking at over 700,000 people found that for every one hour early rising time, you reduce your risk of depression by 23%. So if you go to bed at normally 12, you go to bed at 11, you just dropped it by 23%. Look what you can get down to dropping down to 9 o'clock. Or someone like me who used to go to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning, think of how much the change is when you go to bed at 9 o'clock. I mean, like, I mean, unbelievable, right? So you see how powerful sleep is for your mental health. The research is amazing. And timing and duration of sleep on mental health. Research in the journal Cognitive Therapy and Research revealed that sleep time and duration affect what is called RNT, or repetitive negative thinking. When you're depressed, and I've been depressed, when you have anxiety, or when you have a obsessive compulsive disorder, you have kind of a repetitive negative thinking. You ever had that in your life where you go over and over and over and over the same negative things? And you can't fix it. Maybe it's some past event that you've already been through, and there's no fixing it by, by just going over and over and over it. It doesn't go away. What's done is done. And it, what did it say? It revealed that sleep time, and sleep time and duration, how long you sleep and what time you go to sleep, affect repetitive negative thinking. And what do we see? It turns out that shorter sleep dura duration is correlated with more negative thoughts and obsessive compulsive symptoms. So people with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders, one of the main factors might simply be their sleep time. And it can help them not go over, or like feel like, oh, I need to wash my hands all the time. I need to wash my hands again. I need to wash my hands, or whatever it is. It can be different things in different people. And I don't say that to be put down anybody. I'm just giving an example of what it could be. Or it could be going over and over and over a negative past thought, or experience, rather. So we were told this. This is powerful. This was written way back in 1888. Letter 76 says, wake up in the mornings, 
Set your hour to rise early and bring yourself to it. Then retire at an early hour and you will see that you will overcome many painful disorders which distress the what? We were told all this. Cause These things cause gloomy feelings, discouragement, and unhappy friction and disqualify you for doing anything without great taxation. When you're really depressed or struggle with anxiety, everything you do is a burden. I know. When I was depressed, having to write an email to somebody just felt like the most overwhelming thing. Having to, we, I mean, we, we've produced documentaries, films, and we've shipped them to people who buy them. And shipping it to someone felt like the most, I mean, it was making us an income. And it's like, oh, no, we got to ship a DVD or something. It's just like, <laughs> what on earth? But what does it say? It says your these things, like going to bed late, can cause discouragement, unhappy friction, and disqualify you for doing anything without great taxation. I can testify I know exactly what that's like. Your whole life is a burden. But I can also testify of what it's like to come out of that, where life, many things just become easy to deal with. And the closer we get to these simple principles, notice, notice the things I'm not saying to you is like, buy this $700 uh, you know, pill. This, this will help. And you can only buy it from me, by the way. I have the secret pill, right? No, it's like things that anybody can do. You follow? I'm going to show you a video clip here from, uh, this is also from our YouTube channel, Health and Homestead. So I'll show you this. We've known for decades that it is never safe to touch mercury. When it's in its liquid form, it can actually be absorbed into the skin. But even the simple vapors that come off of mercury can be absorbed into the body. In the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, in Rethinking the Dental Amalgam Dilemma, an integrated toxicological approach, we read mercury has been identified as one of the most toxic non-radioactive materials known to man. But we've been told for 150 years it's safe to put in your mouth. Well, let's actually look at the research. Does it increase the rate of death in infants? What does it do to the brain? Can it increase rates of Alzheimer's disease, depression, anxiety? and even Parkinson's disease. Hey everybody, Chad Cruiser here with Health and Homestead. Now you've probably heard about the Mad Hatter. Now this became popular in certain uh, fictitious novels and these kinds of things, but this term, the Mad Hatter, goes all the way back into medieval Europe. This was a time where hat makers would cure hats using mercury, and as a result of it, they were breathing in those toxic vapors all the time, and they ended up being called mad as a hatter. They noticed that people who, who were working with these hats had higher levels of insanity, and so they called these people mad hatters or mad as a hatter. Is it safe to put in your mouth? That's the question. Is it safe to put it in as a, an amalgam filling? Now, an amalgam comes from the term amalgamation, the mixture of different things. So you'll have different forms of metal and mercury put together and put into the teeth of human beings. So let's look at the research. Research reveals that amalgam or mercury fillings release mercury vapor at 2 to 28 micrograms per day, and it was then discovered that approximately 80% of this mercury is absorbed into the body. But maybe it's okay, right? Well, let's find out. You may have heard that dentists have some of the highest rates of suicide of any profession. It's 68% higher than your average person. I'm going to share with you an incredible story at the end of this of a dentist friend of mine who was tested and found to be mercury toxic. I'm going to tell you about the mental health struggles that he went through and what he did to reverse it. But let's look at mental health and amalgam or mercury fillings. Research reported in the journal Psychological Reports found that women with amalgam fillings had more fatigue, insomnia, more intense anger, anxiety, depression, and more troublemaking decisions than those who did not have amalgam fillings. What they found is that people who did not have amalgam fillings were simply happier people. They were less stressed, they were less anxious, and this is interesting. Now, this is just an association, but it's a very interesting association 
going with the fact that we know that mercury is a neurotoxin. Is it coming from this? We're going to look at more research. Some of the symptoms of mercury poisoning, especially some of the later symptoms, are things like feeling irritable. Maybe you, you, you're just very impatient. It could be that you're shy or antisocial. You don't, you don't like to be around people. You might struggle with anxiety. Many of the people end up struggling with insomnia. One of the things that may be seen are tremors, you know, shaking hands and these kind of things that could be either in the face or in the hands. Some people will find they struggle with concentration. Other people will find that they struggle with their memory. Here's research out of PLOS One in 2018, perinatal death and exposure to dental amalgam fillings during pregnancy. Notice what we read. It says the absolute risk of perinatal death ranged from 0.2 in women with no amalgam fillings teeth to 0.67 in women with 13 or more teeth filled with amalgam fillings. In this situation, you see that it could triple the chances of death. Then when they look at the, all the confounding factors, they say that it's nearly double the risk of having perinatal death. So that would probably include just before the birth that the baby dies in the womb or just after death at some point that the baby dies. And so we can see that nearly nearly double the risk of death. And so now even the FDA, because I know there's some people might be watching and you think, oh, this is quackery. We're only looking at research in the journals, in the peer reviewed journals that are out there. And so we're finding nearly a double the risk of perinatal death in mothers that had mercury fillings. But let's look at research on amalgam fillings and Alzheimer's. Compared with people without amalgam fillings, those with amalgam fillings had higher rates of Alzheimer's, and it's even more highly correlated in women. Research reveals a higher likelihood of having Alzheimer's if you have amalgam fillings or mercury in your mouth. It goes on and on and on. That guy talks a lot. <laughs> so uh, long story short, mercury toxicity. This is something to consider. Um, I did have a mouthful of mercury, and I, I'll just tell you my little testimony. It was back when we were living in Iceland that I had had them, and, and I read some quotations from those old books. And it said if you have one particle in your body of mercury, it has its health-destroying effects. I thought one particle, I got a mouthful of them. And uh, that was before I knew about all the research, but I was just reading those books and I saw that if I had one particle, so I decided I should get them out. So I met the dentist. I was like, hey man, would you take my, mer my mercury fillings out, my amalgams? He's like, yeah, sure, come by. And so I went to do it and I was, I was not making much money. I was making $400 a month. And that's not a lot of money, especially because Iceland, Reykjavik was the... It was in the top 10. It was the seventh most expensive city to live in the world. And so $400 only goes so far. And so I, but you know, I'm conservative with my cash flow. And so I, I get in there and I, I don't remember how, was it seven mercury fillings that I was going to have taken out? And uh, so I said to the guy, I said, hey, uh, well, you know, would you do it? He said, yes. And so I get in there and he says, well, uh, did you want your, did you want me to numb your mouth? And I said, Will it cost more? And he said, yes. I said, no, then just don't. And so he, uh, you, so then he starts drilling, and the first one hurt a lot, you know? And I'm holding on tight, you know, because it feels like electricity is surging through your body as someone's, like, drilling into your teeth. And then you'd think, like, after maybe the second or third, you'd start to get used to it. No, it gets worse. It's just like your body slowly actually can handle it less, you know? And, and what was amazing was, typically in America, when they're drilling into your mouth, they let you spit. He didn't. After a while, I was like, hey, man, do you mind if I spit some of this out? He's like, okay. As if it was a hassle or something like that, right? Like I was supposed to just drink down all of this debris from the mercury fillings. Don't do it in Iceland, okay? <laughs> but since you're not there, if you were to actually do it, and I'm not telling everybody to run out and do this, I'm not saying that, but if you tried everything else and nothing else has worked, if you did do it, I would challenge you to go online and find there are dentists who specialize in removing mercury fillings. 
uh, a friend of ours who I told you mentioned in the video, he was a, he's a dentist and he owned two clinics. You know, dentists are typically really good businessmen. And so he owned two businesses where he had other dentists working for him. And, but he got to the point where he was, he was becoming mad as a hatter. And I don't say that to insult him, but he was going insane, insane. He had to sell both of his businesses and get out of dentistry. He was went and te- he went and tested by a doctor out in Oregon by the name of Doctor Washington. It was Doctor I forget. I sh- I'm sorry I should know, but nevertheless, so he went and got tested. And he was Mer- Mundall. That's right, John Mundall. He was he was mercury toxic. He d- began to do this chelation therapy where you take a certain. Uh, substance and it latches on to the mercury and helps your body just I think urinate it out and he did that and his mental health came back he was able to go back into dentistry he lives a you know healthy life and the 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 point being for some people I'm not saying this is for most people this is probably not the main factor but if you've tried everything else nothing else worked this is at least something to know about and for years the dental community said it wasn't true. They said, no, yeah, we know mercury is a neurotoxin, but it's okay in your mouth. And does that sound right? Like this stuff will kill you, but we can pack your mouth full of it. That just doesn't sound quite right. And so uh, obviously now the science has clearly come out, but let's go forward. So I want to share with you some research on listening to nature and its benefit to your mental health. University of Sussex participants were to listen to either natural environments or artificial environments. The natural environmental sounds included wind in the trees. Another environmental sound was a babbling brook. Isn't it always pleasant to go sit by a creek and just hear that beautiful sound? Don't don't you wish we could all have houses right next to that? Well, I couldn't afford it, so, you know, but we can hear the wind in the trees sometimes, right? And so what do we see? They did MRI scans, and during the natural sound, the brain uh, had an outward focus but during the in during the artificial sounds i don't know maybe they were sounds like cityscapes the natural sounds once again sound of trees sound of a brook and during the artificial sounds the brain had an inward focus similar to what is seen in people with depression anxiety and ptsd or post-traumatic stress disorder isn't that amazing so the sound of a city may be negatively impacting our mental health. And on the converse, the sound of nature could be positively impacting your mental health. Isn't that beautiful? Now, they've also done research on, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, And there's another one we looked, awe. They've done research on awe, and I'm surprised they even did this research. Awe is in in one of, a positive emotion when you are awestruck by something. You're, wow, that's awe, right? It's kind of hard to define, but it's one of several positive emotions that researchers have studied. And they looked at awe, and they discovered that when you have awe-inspiring experiences, it can make you happier and less stressed for a week yeah that's very good isn't it so think about this now if god knew this and he's the great physician he's the great biologist and the great chemist and all of these things if god knew that one day being out in an awe-inspiring experience in nature could help you be happier for a week why didn't he just like give us a day to take off and think about creation He did, didn't he? He gave us the Sabbath to take off, to fellowship, to eat together, to be awe-inspired by God's word, and to get out in nature. Isn't that powerful? It's very powerful. So those who at the beginning of the study, you say, Chad, I'm too busy to get out in nature. Those who at the beginning of the study had the highest levels of stress had the most significant drop in their stress levels during the natural sounds. So the more stressed you are, the more you what? You need to get out in nature. The the more benefit you will attain to. Let's go forward. So nature, and once again, you say, 
well, why didn't God just tell us these things about the sound of a babbling brook or the sound of the wind in the trees? Why didn't he just tell us about all this? Guess what? He did. To walk out after meal and hold the head erect, put back the shoulders and exercise moderately would be a great benefit. The mind will be diverted from what? Self to the beauties of nature. That's exactly what the research today shows. The less the attention is called to the stomach after a meal, the better. If you are in a constant fear that your food will hurt you, it most assuredly will. Forget self and think of something cheerful. We were told before the research ever came out, listen, go out in nature. It'll take your mind off of self and put it out somewhere else. It will give you an outward focus because all the things of the world might give you an inward focus, making you more likely to have anxiety, depression, and PTSD. So get out in nature. But you say, well, that's good, but, but what about telling us about the physiology that nature does to our body? Why weren't we told that? Check this out. Councils on Health, page 171. A sweet sense of restfulness and refreshing comes over them as they listen to what? The murmuring breezes. Isn't that what the study was about? The drooping spirits revive. The waning strength is recruited. Unconsciously, the mind becomes peaceful. The fevered pulse more calm and regular. We were even told the physiology. What would happen? This is exactly what happens. Fascinating. Nature and mental health. Nature, anxiety, and depression. A study was conducted to see if time in nature would benefit major depressive disorder. And 12 individuals had MDD, major depressive disorder, at the, at, at the outset were tested in regard to their short-term memory. They were then asked to think back on a problematic, unresolved issue in their life. And they, then they went on two separate occasions, one week apart, on a 50-minute walk in nature in the city or in the city. So you either go in the nature or in the city. And the result, the participants had a substantial increase in memory span after the nature walk compared to the city walk. Exercise is important, but getting it out in nature has an additional benefit of enhancing your memory. Isn't that good news? That is phenomenal. So the mood scores were also better after the nature walk, so they became happier people too. This is incredible. Let's go forward. This is the subgenual, this little red area here, this is called the subgenual prefrontal cortex. And it has been shown that rumination is a risk factor for mental illness. What is rumination? You know what a ruminant is? It's an animal, like a cow, that does what with its food? Chews and chews and chews. That's a ruminant, rumination. They're ruminants. But in our mind, rumination is chewing on the same thing over and over and over. Repetitive negative thoughts, RNT, right? What does the research show? It shows that a study was reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States of America, and they had healthy individuals walk for 90 minutes in either an urban setting or a natural environment. And those who walked for 90 minutes in a natural setting had a decrease in activity in the subgenual prefrontal cortex and lower levels of rumination. This is exciting to know. So if you're really struggling with repetitive negative thoughts the next day, maybe you work, you can't do it at work, but when you get off work, you can go out and go for a walk in nature. And you know, they even showed, you think, yeah, but I live in, you think, Chad, but you live in, in Michigan, you know, you get winter, it's rough up there. It is, it gets rough where we live, get, you know, deep snow. And um, so you think, well, it doesn't have the same benefit in the winter. One of the studies on this was done at University of Michigan, and they even did it in the winter, and it had the same cognitive benefit. So this is wonderful. So the same benefit was not seen in those who had an urban walk. So you don't have that mental benefit walking in the city. You do get a good benefit for your cardiovascular system, but not for your mental health. And so uh, think of uh, each health habit as a weight on your back. This, this is a good illustration that we came up with. So you've heard about a burden, right? A burden on you. Imagine each one of the, the, if you're living out the, if you're not living out any of these health principles, for each one, you add a 20-pound sack to your back. 
You add two, and it gets a little heavier, but you can keep walking with 40 pounds on your back. You can even do it with 60 pounds on your back, but it's getting harder. But you start getting up to 100 pounds on your back when you're not doing five of these. And if you're not doing nine of these, you're talking 180 pounds on your back. Are you going to walk very far? No. So let's say you're not doing any of them, and you take one off. You might be able to take a few extra steps, but it's still going to be hard. Remember, it said that everything can be a burden. So if you begin to say, hey, I haven't been doing any exercise. I'm going to get some exercise. You're going to take 20 pounds off your back. You, you haven't been getting out in the sunlight at all. And I got to tell you something. For anyone, uh, for all of us, sunlight is important. But the darker the skin, the more sun we need. Because in order to get vitamin D, lighter skin people burn very fast. And we get, we get you know, vitamin D very quickly. So the more time you get out in it, the better, the darker your skin is. And so that's just a good thing to know. And so, but, so if you, if you then get out in the sun, now you've taken 40 pounds off and then you add to that, you, you know, you're out in nature, you've taken another 20 pounds off and you're doing all of these things. You're getting out in fresh air. You're getting the idea that it's all adding up. And after a while you start walking with a swifter gait, with a freer step. And you start feeling better. And life isn't so heavy anymore. Do you follow? So all these things are very simple. Now, you might think, ah, I don't need to do most of those. I'll just do that one. Well, good. That will make a benefit to you. But the more you add on, the better it will be. Now, I know to start all these tomorrow, if you weren't doing anything, that would be too much. Start with one of them tomorrow. I don't know. Go for a little walk or eat a little better tomorrow. You could probably start with two. But as you do, you begin to add these things back into your life and find, because many of these things little kids do by default, don't they? They're out getting exercise in the sunlight, and they're drinking their water, and out in the fresh air, and, and you see how many things they're getting. Now, the healthy food today is not so popular like it used to be. But, you know, back when you were kids, more people did eat healthy food, right? So... The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 14, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Over and over, one of the things you'll see in the Bible is that healing and salvation are connected. Now, that does not mean you'll be healed of all your diseases here on planet Earth. Did you know that it is God's ultimate will for your healing? that everybody would be healed. But all that healing isn't done on earth. It will be done up there, though. Right? We may have diseases here that we cannot get rid of on planet earth. But someday, there'll be no more tears nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, right? We will walk and not be weary, right? We will run and not be faint, but the good news is you might be surprised how much better you can do even now here on earth. The more of this you implement into your life. This is powerful. Jesus himself experienced, this is a, a prophecy in Psalms 22, that on Jesus being depressed. Did Jesus go through depression? This, you'll see that it's about him. You don't have to guess. Jesus said in Psalms 22, 1 and 2, My God, my God, why hast thou what? Forsaken me. This is going to tell us the psychology of what was going on in Jesus' mind on the cross. Why are you so far from me helping me? This is what he's quoting when he's on the cross, the first part. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he's being separated from his father for the first time, Jesus had had communion with his father from all eternity. And here he is on the cross, your sin, my sin being placed upon him on the cross, and he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. This is the emotion of Jesus on the cross. He is feeling like, why does the Father not hear me now? He's always heard me. But because our sins were separating him, he had to experience what it would be like to be fully lost. 
He is going through the pains of hell on the cross, being separated from his father. And it's, Father, why have you left me? It's as if he has no hope at this point. He goes on, and now his, mind, his, his thoughts begin to change in verse 3 when he says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So notice, at first he just sees the darkness, the darkness, the darkness, and when we're depressed, that seems to be all we see. But then instead of focusing on the darkness, he turns his eyes to the Father and to his light. He says, you're the one. You are holy, you who inhabit the praises of Israel. And then he goes on to say, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you did, not, and you did deliver them. They cried unto you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not confounded. Notice now he's claiming the promises of the experience of Israel. You didn't give up on them. They were great sinners above all. And yet you didn't give up on them. Maybe you won't give up on me. When you feel lost, when I was depressed, I felt completely lost. I prayed every day. I would spend many days and hours in the word of God seeking God, feeling like he wasn't listening and I couldn't be saved. But I kept pressing forward. I kept seeking the Lord. And it was, I'll tell you, reading the Bible felt like it was a book that was written for the sole purpose of condemning my soul. That's what it felt like. And it was hard to read every day because it seemed like it was all about my sin. But I look back on it. I felt completely lost. And I look back after I came out of the depression and I say, I don't believe that I was lost during that time. I just felt that way. The Bible doesn't say, by feelings are you saved. It's by grace are you saved through faith. Even if you feel lost, you turn to the Father. You turn to the Savior who is there praying for you right now. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for you. Jesus is praying for you right now. When you feel lost, Jesus is praying for you. He's not giving up on you. He knows what it's like to feel lost. He knows what it's like to be depressed. But you know what? His depression didn't last for eternity. He came out of the tomb. And friends, Jesus, do not give up because you feel like you can't be saved or you feel lost or because you're depressed. Do not give up. I'm so glad. I remember at the very darkest point of my depression, the thought came to me, what if you have to live with this for the rest of your life? And then you know what my, the very next thought that came to my mind is, then I accept it because there's nowhere else to go. I know Jesus has the words of life, even if I don't feel it. I'm going to trust it anyway. Friends, trust in Jesus even if it feels hopeless. Jesus is not giving up on you. Friends, so I want to challenge you. Give your life to him. Accept him as your personal savior. Sometimes we feel lost just because, I, for me, it was a gut issue. When my gut healed, my mind healed. So your depression may be a physiological thing. It might be just repetitive thoughts, but I can almost guarantee if you have repetitive habitual thoughts, there's something going on physiologically that is messing with your head. But God can help you. Implement some of these things and you may find some of the same benefits. Let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus who knows what it's like to be us because he experienced all of our guilt, all of our shame, and even all of our depression. Father, if there's someone here that's been struggling, someone maybe for many years, maybe a decade like I was, Lord, I pray that you would help them to implement as many things as they can, maybe one at a time because they can't implement nine things at a time. 
But Lord, that one burden, one 20 pound sack would come off their back and then another and another and another. And that soon that they would begin to rejoice in the salvation of the Lord, that they would find a peace that passes all understanding, that in all their ways they would acknowledge you and that you would direct their paths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A- any more questions before we go? Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. Uh- can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, you were speaking about the mercury. Yes, sir. In the teeth and, and things like that and the problems that it has. And I knew about this uh, some years ago. And I asked my uh, dentist because he used, a, this was in 2011, he used a silver grayish kind of filling. Yeah. And I said, is that mercury? He said, no, we're not allowed to use that anymore. Okay. And so, but I don't know if... Like, I have never heard that it's been technically outlawed to do, but he may, maybe at his particular off, as far as, I mean, unless I, I'm not a dentist either. So it is possible they've gotten rid of it, and I, I'm not aware of that, but I've not, I think I would have probably heard that if it were the case, but I, I could be wrong, so, but go yes, ahead. So I was wondering, like, there's been times where there will be headaches and you know, for no, you know, you don't know where to come yeah. from this, that, or the other. So I was wondering if, if he lied, <laughs> you know, and maybe mercury is in there. And so my second question: If a person has mercury fillings, and some of that is seeping into the system, uh, does activated charcoal absorb that, and can it be moved out through the bowel? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I, I, it probably can make a difference. I don't know that it will get rid of all of it. Um, and you know, one of the reasons I almost don't even sometimes want to tell the whole mercury thing is because it does cost money. Everything else we talk about is pretty much free in this, in this case. This one, the only reason I share that one, I don't want most people, most headaches are probably not from mercury. So I don't want to think like, oh, every headache. I used to get headaches regularly, and then I went when I finally went on a whole food diet, I used to get migraines regularly. When I went on a whole food diet with nothing refined, my migraines just went away. I don't get them anymore. So there's probably other factors, but in a certain sect of society, that potentially could be it. If you're doing everything else you can in a healthy way, and you still have them, then it may be that. But I, I wouldn't expect that that's everything, but it, it potentially could be a factor in this, along with depression. Yes, and if, if at some point you have the funds to do it and you want to remove it, I mean, I guess you have to find out if it's even true. I, I don't know about that situation with that doc, dentist. Hopefully he's telling the truth. I really don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, so when, when I, I, years ago, I knew just the quotes. I didn't know all the scientific studies that I showed you today. I, I knew what we were told, and I knew it was true by that, that if we have one particle in our body, it has its health destroying effects. And so I talked to a dentist friend and I said, so, uh, yeah, hey, about the whole, you know, stick of mercury in people's mouth. He's like, oh, well, you see, there's a difference. There's organic mercury and inorganic mercury. And I don't remember which one they say, oh, we use the inorganic or, or vice versa. And that one's fine. Yeah, right. You know, I, uh, sometimes we, once again, stories we tell our children, which we shouldn't tell our children stories that aren't true. And yeah, he, but he might have been right. Maybe there's some kind of other metal type filling that looks like a mercury filling that's not. It could be. I mean, it's very possible, but I don't know and, about that. What, what was your answer regarding the activated charcoal? I'm, it would probably make somewhat of a difference, but I'm guessing, I mean, it, maybe it would, maybe it would be good enough. I don't know. But but if you don't, in the, in the long run, get rid of the source, you know, because it's going to keep leaching, 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 if it is a mercury filling, if it is the cause, and it may not be. But, yeah, it, it may make some difference, but I would probably do it more after I got rid of it than, and I'm not telling you all need to go get rid of it. If you have no health issues, and, and I, I'm not even trying to promote that. It's just I'm sharing the research because it is, is one potential factor. And, yes, sir. Yeah, you you can pass that on. Go ahead there. Yeah, we had an online question. Online uh, question. 
from this morning says, do you have a detailed program for where food plant based, uh, for food plant based diets such as a cookbook? Do you guys offer? We do, we do. And I'll tell you more information about that tomorrow after our, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we'll tell you more about the information on, on cookbook and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's second question. Um, what, what's the relation? I spoke uh, briefly to your wife about it uh, after this morning search um, presentation. Um, do you have, or is there a connection between bloating and gut health? Yeah, and like gas and thing? bloating and so forth. Yes, there is a connection. There are a number of connections there. And I, I heard, I used to have, um, I'll just tell you, after this is just being kind of personal. Obviously, we're kind of personal in our speaking, <laughs> a little too much probably sometimes. But uh, we, I used, to, after going plant based, I had just terrible gas all the time. And I just thought that was from eating plant based foods. You just have to have gas all the time. That's just the side effect of it. And then a friend of ours who is a like nutritionist or something like that, Michelle, is that what she is? I forget what she is, but nevertheless, a dietitian. I think she's a dietitian. And she, she, when she heard that, I was like, oh yeah, I just, you know, I have gas all the time. She's like, well, then that means you have a problem with your, with your digestion. And I was like, no, that's just what happens when you eat all plants all the time, you know? And she's like, no, you have problems with your, you know, with your digestion. And, and I didn't really realize that, but later on I did find that to be the case. Like if my digestion is very good, there's hardly any gas. If something's going wrong, and you have a bunch of gas, something's wrong. That is not a, a healthy, a, that's not a healthy thing for your gut to be having all kinds of gas. And so obviously we're getting kind of personal here, but one of the things that you can do, and we already mentioned it, but we didn't tell you that this could happen from it. One of the things that can give you a lot of gas, well, there's a few, there's a bunch of things that can, but one of them, okay, I'll give you a few. One of them is not chewing enough. If you chew your food, if you really, really, really chew your food till it's basically liquefied, you probably will have significantly less gas. A second factor is if you don't eat beans very often and you eat beans, you'll be more likely to have gas. But if you eat them regularly, your body starts getting used to it and is less likely to have as much trouble with it. But even with the beans, if you wanna have less gas, you really need to chew, 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 chew the beans. So that is another factor. Another thing you can do for the beans is soaking them overnight and washing away the water is important. And another thing you can do to really help the beans is to do a slow cooker all night. A pressure cooker is really quick, but it may not help so much. It might really soften them up, so they seem like they should be really good, but you might actually find that the slow cooking overnight, like in a slow cooker or a crock pot type thing, or even in an instant pot just overnight, can help you with the gas problem. That can be one for the beans. Another factor that can cause gas issues. I have a whole video on our channel, uh, Health and Homestead. I think I have a whole video on gas, I think. But I'll tell you one more thing is that in dried fruit, most dried fruit will not be a serious cause of gas, but the kinds that can, I'm not someone who just eats organic. I think it would be great if you could just eat organic, but you know, when, when you don't have the funds for it and I don't have the funds for it, and um, I'm not here to argue eat one way or the other, but when it comes to dried fruit, non-organic dried fruit, they typically put into it either potassium sorbate or sulfur. And that can really disrupt the sulfur that they put in it can really disrupt the gut and cause serious gas issues or even diarrhea in those people who are susceptible to it. So that's one other factor that can really create gas problems. There's really a number of them. A, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of preservatives in food are detrimental to your digestion because think about it. A preservative is trying to preserve the food. Is your stomach trying to preserve food? No, it's trying to break it down. And if you put things into the stomach that are trying to preserve it, they're at a war with your digestive juices, right? And so, you know, standard food that is trying preservatives is also a troubling thing. So th those are just a few things. And, and mixing too many things at one meal can also do it. Too, yeah, like potluck, you know, when there's like 15 different things and you think, I got to have a little of each. 
and each one of them has 15 ingredients. So now you have like 300 things at one meal, and you go home and you're like, man, potluck's the most dangerous meal of the week, right? So, and then you just feel bad for the rest of the day. When you mix a ton of things together, it's harder on your digestion. Does that make sense? So long answer to a short question. Did you have another question or no? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Do you know anything about um, eating in certain environments and how that helps or hurts you? Um, like eating in front of the television versus, um, and, or, and eating where there's a lot of talking going on, whether, um, you know, versus just eating in a quiet environment. Um, that kind of thing. I've heard Great question. No, I get, I get what you're saying. And, and it is a good question. And the answer is yes. There, so, and, and we kind of read one of the quotations there too, that being stressed at mealtime, like for instance, news, when you watch news, you're typically happy and at peace, right? No, right? It's like, you know, I don't know, 2,000 people died of coronavirus today, and this happened today, and these two political parties are screaming at each other, and, and uh, you're, you're, you're stressed, right? And stress during mealtime is raising stress hormones, things like cortisol and adrenaline. These things are surging through the body, and these things are not things, you don't want adrenaline surging through your body as you're eating. You want to be at peace. You want to be comfortable. So as much as possible, being in a comfortable setting where you're not stressed is very, very important. Yeah, and you're not bringing up a bunch of negative stories or negative gossip or talking about people bad from church or wherever it is or, or my husband does this or my wife does this. But being as positive as possible during mealtime is going to help your digestion. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I think we'll make this the last one, and then we will come back tomorrow, and if you have any more. And you had mentioned dry fruits. Yes, sir. Being good. Mm -hmm. um, what about, like, dry cereals? Like, shredded wheat, dry cereals without, like, almond milk and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dried cereals actually can be an easier way. So, uh, but let me, let me clarify. And I, So, once again, bad best right there there's this progression and even when it comes to like dried cereals so you do have things like shredded wheat which is just a hundred percent whole wheat it's dried that is actually i mean that's way up there on the level of good like and you know it doesn't the the kind i don't know if shredded wheat is the but basically you are you have these what's that where it's the whole grain and that's all it is. Then you have other ones that have tons of sugar added in there and then it's you know it's down the list of ways. And so but on that subject, there it can be very good. And even like the original granola was a very good thing made by John Harvey Kellogg. It was not packed full of like, today we pack them full with refined foods like tons of oil, tons of sugar. They become a highly fatty and a highly sugary food at the same time and can increase your hypoglycemic problems. But when it's closer to the whole, dried things like cereal can be a very good thing to really chew, 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 chew and eat. So they can be good, yes. To answer the question, but when they're packed with sugar and don't, you know, they're not as healthy, obviously. All right, so we'll call it good. And tomorrow morning, we are going to look, well, tomorrow we're going to look at 9.30, and we'll be back 9.30 and 11. One of the things we're going to look at tomorrow, tomorrow morning will be transform brain, transform life. Then we'll look at foods that can make you angry, depressed, uh, have anxiety, all of these things. It's going to be powerful information tomorrow at 11. I mean, it's incredible. So we'll see you then.